So this is really how your friendship with Moynihan begins, yes. is with this letter yep. from another famous conservative, Irving Kristol. It says that you are conservative, true, very smart, true, very nice, true, and a no. true blue intellectual. <laughs> Two and a half speed. <laughs> yeah. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, late Senator of New York, who was also United States Ambassador to the United Nations, close advisor to both LBJ and Richard Nixon. Not many people can say that. And your lifelong close friend. What would Moynihan have to teach us about our situation today? He was a world-class social scientist. Certainly the sci finest social scientist ever served in the legislative branch. He's justly remembered and rightly remembered for his famous aphorism, everyone is entitled to their own opinions but not their own facts. He respected data. What I loved about Pat was he started from facts, from reasoning from the data, because he was a social scientist. We need more of that today? We need a lot more of that. Lord knows we're, we're in the opinion business, I'm in the opinion business. but. Opinions are only interesting when they take off from a, a large sediment of fact. Now, Moynihan was not a conservative. That's correct. He was a New Deal liberal. And, and you engaged with him over decades in conversations. Did that engagement, did that relationship form the kind of conservative you became? I think so. Pat was so much fun. A woman entering the uh, House of Commons in Britain recently said in her maiden speech, she said, democracy is like sex. If it isn't messy, you're not doing it right. <laughs> and I would modify that to the extent to say that politics is like sex. If it isn't fun, you're not doing it right. Pat had an enormous capacity for pleasure and happiness in what he was doing. This Time Magazine cover from the 1964 convention was hanging in Barry Goldwater's Senate office. This very one. This very one. A new thrust in American politics. Carried 44 states for Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> I thought it was more. Now your book is dedicated to Barry Goldwater, who, uh, the late Barry Goldwater, who's a senator from Arizona, probably most famous in American history for his candidacy as the Republican nominee in 1964, uh, as an unapologetic conservative, small government. But I think it's probably in our day a somewhat controversial choice of dedication because he's also known for opposing things most people believe are wise, such as the Civil Rights Bill and so on. Make the case for your dedication and for Goldwater's legacy. I cast my first presidential vote in 1964 for Barry Goldwater. But back then, conservatism was considered naughty but not serious. This liberal consensus was so strong. And Barry came along and said, I don't like the way the country's going. 1964 this was. I was at Princeton in graduate school. Goldwater finished third in the faculty poll at Princeton behind Lyndon Johnson and some peace and freedom candidate from somewhere. <laughs> what Goldwater said was this, sooner or later you're going to find out that as the government becomes more solicitous, it becomes less respected. And look what's happened. 1964, 70% of the American people said they trusted the government to do the right thing or almost all the right thing all the time. 70%. Today it's under 20%. Since 1964, the government has become so permeating in American life. And as its pretensions have increased, its prestige has decreased. The irony here, the cunning of history, if you will, is that Goldwater made this possible. By losing in a huge landslide in 1964, the Democrats elected for the first time since 1938, when the country recoiled against Franklin Roosevelt's idea to pack the courts, another bad idea whose time has come again, until between 38 and 64, there was no liberal legislating majority in Congress. Suddenly there was one. And Lyndon Johnson took full advantage of it to this eruption of legislation to produce the Great Society. And government grew promiscuously, and as I say, its prestige plummeted.
Why? Because the government lost track of its proper scope and its actual competence. The unintended consequences of the Goldwater candidacy. I used to say that Goldwater didn't lose. It just took them 16 years to count the votes. He won in 1980 with Ronald Reagan. There's a lengthy passage in your book about religion. Specifically... The whole chapter. Yes. Called Conservatism Without Theism. It's about religion and why it is not necessary to being a conservative. We live in a time when probably the hard core of what's considered the conservative movement in this country consists of evangelical Christians. And along comes George Will to explain, a, I think what some people find is sort of surprisingly, not just non, non-religious take on conservatism. Tell us a little bit about your personal background as an atheist and how that informs your political philosophy. First of all, I'm not hostile to religion. I am, an, as I have said, an amiable, low-voltage atheist. I'm married to a ferocious Presbyterian. I'm not sure there are any other kinds. But anyway, <laughs> I grew up in an utterly secular household. My father was the son of a Lutheran minister, and he used to sit outside Pastor Will's study and listen to the pastor and some of his more thoughtful parishioners argue about the problem of reconciling grace and free will. My father, um, having seen quite enough of churches by the time he grew up, became a philosopher, professor of philosophy at the University of Illinois. He too was a non-believer. So the question never arose in my household. Uh, So I was sort of startled when I mentioned in something I'd written that I was a non-believer and people were either scandalized or surprised or God knows what. God knows. <laughs> um, I, not, I think Bill Buckley was right. A conservative need, need not be religious, but he cannot despise religions. I think the great religions express common, durable human anxieties and aspirations and worries and questions. The founding fathers were, to a remarkable extent, uh, deists. That is, they believed that God cranked up the universe, set in motion like a clock, and then absconded. A deist god is like a distant, wealthy ant in Australia. Uh, (laughs) Benevolent, but not often heard from. My argument in the chapter, Conservatism Without Theism, is not just that conservatism does not depend on theism, but that there is a conservative sensibility that rejoices in the world of things, the unpredictable, unplanned nature of things. Virginia Prestel, a very wise a writer in Washington, once said, the story of the Bible distilled to its essence is God created man and woman and lost control of events. Conservatives, proper conservatives, someone with the conservative sensibility, loves the fact that events are out of control. Good. Who knows where it'll go? But that's part of the fun. You look at the universe, and we're such an infinitesimally insignificant cooling cinder at the back of beyond in this enormously expanding universe, expanding into what no one knows. Some people either find this frightening or depressing. A conservative sensibility says, no, this is what we like about life. In a way, as I listen to you, it's, it, it comes together with your critique of progressivism because progressives are playing God, as it were. They're trying to constantly impose order on what is essentially permanent chaos. Yes, and the chaos, what Hayek called spontaneous order of society, is creative. The fecundity of freedom that we live with on a daily life um, is what conservatives want to protect from the fatal conceit, another Hayek word, the fatal conceit that we can plan the future and do it better than the spontaneous creative energies of American life. 327 million Americans getting up in the day, making billions of decisions a day that drive the society. Now that brings us to the present day and the present president, whose name, by the way, it's Donald Trump, does not appear in your book. Now that can't be an accident. The names of Charlemagne, Audrey Hepburn, and Duke Ellington don't appear in the book. Either. That's true. <laughs> because this is a book about ideas, and uh, the current president is not part of that 
discussion. He has nothing to do with conservatism. He really, to his credit, has never pretended to be a, a conservative. Uh, he's an entrepreneur in politics, and he's maximizing whatever he wants to maximize. But the, the, this is a book about important arguments, and he's not part of that. You made a great impression by, uh, in the midst of the Trump run for the presidency, uh, renouncing your membership in the Republican Party on principle because of his nomination. And in listening to you describe your critique of progressivism, in a way, I think it goes together with your critique of Donald Trump. You've written many times that his cardinal sin, so to speak, is to attempt to control things through tariffs, through uh, bullying, that, that in some ways his essential flaw is the same flaw that progressives, uh, or the same, the same error that progressivism commits. Sure. Trade wars are easy to win. Oh, yeah? You go out to Iowa, and you'll stand there in a soybean field, and the farmer will say, one in three of those rows of soybeans were going to go to, to China. Oops. Looking on the bright side, as I am strongly disinclined to do. But in this case, the physics of our politics is going to work. Equal and opposite reactions. Donald Trump represents, in a way, the culmination of the grotesque inflation of the presidency. There was a time, 60 years ago at least, when conservatives believed strongly in congressional supremacy. Their text was James Burnham's book, Congress and the American Tradition, because they had seen correctly that under Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson, the presidency was the engine of expanding government. Well, then they had the heady, intoxicating, deranging experience of Ronald Reagan. They said, Lord, this is fun, having executive power. So they became part of this absurd inflation of the presidency. The alchemists used to think they could turn lead into gold. We now think 270 electoral votes turns a run-of-the-mill politician into a savant into someone who will create jobs and run the economy and all the rest. Great moment in a great big moment in American history. In his first fireside chat, Roosevelt began with two words that do not appear on the transcript of his fireside chat in the library at Hyde Park. The two words were, my friends. Well, you say, what's the matter with that? I don't want presidents to be my friend. I want them to occupy the executive branch and do what the Article 2 says, which is simply take care that the laws are faithfully executed. That's enough. Don't be our moral tutor. Don't embody the nation. Don't run the country. 327 million Americans are busy doing that. Leave them alone. It, it, it works. Donald Trump at the convention that nominated him in Cleveland, in a way, was the culmination of the progressive view. Only I can fix it. Well, right back to the, and it's, all, it's in my book, it goes right back to Theodore Roosevelt and the stewardship idea of the presidency. Roosevelt said, whatever I am not forbidden to do explicitly, I am permitted to do. We go from there to what we've got. Where do conservatives go now? Is there a refuge for them? Is the Republican Party still their home? Do they need to look somewhere else? The Republican Party today is more homogenized than ever before in its history. The Republican Party has been warring with itself since Teddy Roosevelt decided he wanted the presidency back and went to war against William Howard Taft. That war is over in the sense that the Republican Party is Mr. Trump's party. At the 500-day mark in Ronald Reagan's presidency, he had the support of 77% of Republicans. At the 500-day mark in the Trump presidency, he had the support of 87% of Republicans. We've seen with Senator Corker, Senator Flake, Congressman Sanford, what happens to people who break ranks. What this means is that the Madisonian premise of rival institutions has fallen apart. The Republican herd believes its job is to be teammates of the president. Madison would be spinning in his grave about this, among many other things, because he wanted the executive branch and the legislative branch to have a creative rivalry. It's 
quite fashionable to uh, criticize the founders of the United States. We hear a lot of uh, talk now about how the Senate is so unfair, the Electoral College is misconceived, uh, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were slaveholders. Uh, contrary to that trend, this book, I think, can be understood as a defense of the founders and of their vision. And I'd like to ask you to explain why you defend the founders and why you consider it not just valid, but very important to recover uh, their vision today. I think you can understand American political thought and our current condition by understanding the argument between two Princetonians, James Madison of the class of 1771 and Thomas Woodrow Wilson, Tommy as he was known at Princeton, <laughs> uh, of the class of 1879. Woodrow Wilson was the first president to criticize the American founding, which he didn't do peripherally, he did root and branch. He said the fundamental Madisonian architecture of the Constitution is wrong because the separation of powers is wrong. And it's wrong because it inhibits the government from acting with dispatch, quickness, nimbleness. What worried the founders didn't worry Woodrow Wilson. What worried the founders was factions and majority rule and majority abuses of minorities. Wilson thought we'd evolved so far, we'd become modern and had achieved a consensus about life, and we didn't need to worry about factions and minorities' rights and that sort of thing. So in that sense, the progressives have been remarkably forthright and amazingly successful in overturning the founders' vision, which was natural rights, which means first come rights, then come government. And government's function is inherently limited by the natural rights doctrine. I think the most important word in the Declaration of Independence is secure. All men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and governments are instituted to secure those rights. That inherently limits the function of government, in theory. It hasn't worked out that way in practice. But to understand the tension between the progressives understanding that we must emancipate government for enormous enterprises, and the founder's much more constricted view of what politics is about. So let's go back to that word secure, because in contrast, I guess the idea would be a more kind of European idea, which is governments exist to create and grant rights. And I think if we're honest, we would say that in American culture today, that has taken hold, that idea that it's the government's job to sort of confer rights and indeed benefits on people. Well, what's really wrong with that? And why do you feel that it's more, um, uh, more consistent with freedom to think of the government as having just the function of securing rights? In the speech that made Ronald Reagan's political career, the speech in the Goldwater campaign called A Time for Choosing, uh, Ronald Reagan said, today we now seem to believe that rights are dispensations from government. And indeed, that's what the progressive vision is, that government doles out rights with in mind the public interest. And when it thinks the rights serve the public interest, it hands them out, and when it doesn't, it doesn't. That is a government that has a relationship with the citizens where the citizens truly become subjects of the government. Franklin Roosevelt, uh, in the campaign in, in 1932, said as much in a great speech in the San Francisco uh, Commonwealth Club. He said, we're offering partly a new deal in that we'll have a bargain. The government will do this and the uh, citizens will be compliant. So I also thought of your book as a uh, contrast between certain people or who are kind of the heroes of the book and then there are certain villains of the, of the book. One of your heroes is definitely James Madison. I think you alluded to him earlier. Briefly explain to a contemporary American who doesn't know a lot about Madison necessarily why they too should think of Madison as their hero. I would tell them to read Federalist 10 and Federalist 51. Before Madison came along and affected a revolution in democratic theory, everyone who had thought democracy was possible, and there weren't that many who did, 
thought it was possible only in a small, face-to-face, homogenous society, because a homogenous society would not have factions. Rousseau's Geneva, Pericles Athens, someplace you could walk across in a day. Madison came along and they had a different catechism for the founders. The founders said, what is the worst outcome of politics? The answer is tyranny. To what form of tyranny are democracies prey? Tyranny of the majority. Solution, don't have majorities. Don't have, that is, stable, tyrannical majorities. Have majorities that are constellations of constantly shifting factions. To do this, have an extensive republic, to use Madison's term. So in Federalist uh, 10, he said, the first duty of government is to protect the different and unequal capacities of acquiring property. That would guarantee a plethora of factions and an unstable society in the sense that you didn't have a stable, tyrannical majority. In Federalist 51, Madison said, you see throughout our system the process of supplying by opposite and rival interests the defect of better motives. The framers, flinty realists that they were, were not going to rely upon good motives. They said we're going to disperse power through the separation of powers, and properly rivalrous institutions will resist one another and prevent any stable abuse of power. That was the theory. Hitherto, the ancient philosophers said, define the best and aim for it in politics. The framers said, no, that's a little bit risky. We're going to orient ourselves. We're going to take our bearings from the low and solid and predictable in life, including interestedness, and therefore, they aim not to prevent, to achieve the best, but to prevent the worst, which again was tyranny. Well, I want to pick up on that point because, again, I think you're getting at something that is really essential to this book, which is bringing to our time a sense of the uh, downside of government and the whole concept of unintended consequences. We live in a time where really it's not just on the left, but really, if you consider Donald Trump the right, Um, There's a sense that government exists to intend good things and go out and get them, and that what matters most about political action is your good intentions. And uh, so I'd like to ask you to to discuss a little bit about why it is so important in Madison's thought, and therefore for us today, to keep an eye on the possibilities that things could go wrong. Well, the sentimental and romantic view of government is that it is the one thing in life that's disinterested that is inherently altruistic. Public choice theory came along from James Buchanan and others at the University of Virginia and said, wait a minute. Public choice theory simply says, just as in the private sector, we understand that people try to maximize their affluence. In the public sector, they try to maximize their power. They are not disinterested, they are not angelic. And therefore, you must understand the government is an advocate, a party, an interest group itself, a faction. And when it's as enormous as it is, you expect people to cluster around. Someone has wisely said that when you lay out a picnic, you expect ants. And the biggest picnic in the world is the US federal budget. There is a reason why, what, five of the 10 wealthiest counties in the United States by per capita income are in the Washington area. We don't make anything here except trouble and laws and regulations. We have no natural resources. What we do is distribute trillions of dollars in one way or another. And people come to affect the influence in this flow of money. Now, if there is a villain in your book, it might be uh, Woodrow Wilson. I've got to say, he, he enjoys otherwise a very good reputation in the United States. He has schools named after him. He has a bridge here in uh, Washington named after him. He is known as the man who led us through World War I. He's the only president buried in Washington. And, and you present a devastating critique that I think will strike a lot of people as new in that you identify Wilson as a kind of founder of modern progressivism. Um, Tell us a little bit about what was so mistaken about Wilson's vision and how it is still kind of, those mistakes are reverberating today. Recently at Princeton, some African-American students becoming cognizant of 
Woodrow Wilson's very retrograde views on race. He actually resegregated the federal workforce. We're up in arms and wanted to rename things because they're named at Woodrow Wilson School and Wilson College and all the rest. And I called the president of Princeton, Chris Eisgruber, and I said, offered to come to Princeton and teach them how to really dislike Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> uh, Woodrow Wilson simply believed that, in fact, government now uh, had to transcend, had, to out, had outgrown the Madison architecture. He said it was all very well once to worry about the separation of powers and all that when we were three or four million people scattered along the fringe of a continent, 80% of people living within 20 miles of Atlantic tidewater. But now, he said, we're a giant continental empire united by copper wires and steel rails, and therefore we need a government with the ability to act decisively and emphatically and quickly to regulate the forces of industrialism and all that's let loose. Again, that's fine as long as you think the government is and will always remain an independent umpire calling balls and strikes. Government, however, is an interest group, and it is inevitably the biggest interest group, and because it has a monopoly on violence and coercion, it is the most dangerous interest group. That's what the founders thought. Well, there's someone else you talk about in your book, and that's the famous economist Friedrich von Hayek, who is well known for theorizing about the role of information in government decision making. And his, the point he elaborated is that it's impossible for any central authority to know all the things you would need to know to manage the country the way a progressive wanted it to be managed. Isn't that really at the heart of what you find um, so troubling about Wilson's thought, that he aspired to that kind of omniscience? Hayek preached epistemic humility. <laughs> Epistemology is the field of philosophy about how we know things. He said the market is nothing but an information generating device. And when you interfere with the market or ignore the market, you're either interfering with the generation of information or ignoring information. Now, the Soviet Union died of ignorance. It didn't know what things should cost. The Soviet Union would manufacture shoes with the marvelous value subtraction. That is, the shoes were worth less than the materials that went into them. They had no idea how to function. Hayek alerts everyone to the law of unintended consequences. It is rightly said that conservatives understand the law of unintended consequences. I think conservatives are conservatives because the law of unintended consequences, which is when you intervene in a complex system like a society, the unintended consequences of what you do are apt to be larger than and contrary to the intended consequences. Society is like a Calder mobile. You jiggle something here and things jiggle all the way over there. So be very careful. Another theme of your book is that we sort of are living with the accumulated, some would say encrusted, legacy of past government interventions, which you call the administrative state, that whole bureaucracy that goes by the alphabet soup of names from EPA to SEC and so on. You're uh, quite passionate about the dangers that this poses. I mean, I think a lot of people have grown up with the assumptions that no, those agencies or what protect us against pollution and so forth. Talk a little bit about why people ought to be more concerned than they seem to be about the growth of the administrative state. Because the administrative state is unaccountable and because the administrative state exists to take power that cannot properly be delegated to them but is delegated to them by the Congress, which is so busy, A, getting reelected, but also micromanaging society that it can't do its own business. Therefore, it increasingly passes laws, in quotation marks, that are actually sentiments. We should have a clean environment. You people over there work out the details. We should have a quality education for everybody. You, you're down at the education department. You write the regulations that will put meaning into that. Uh, Christopher DeMuth, who great thinker in our town says that Congress engages in velities now, just expresses nice sentiments and leaves it to the bureaucracy. Well, the bureaucracy goes way off writing the rules and regulations. Walk into the office of Senator Mike Lee of Utah, you'll see two piles of paper. One's about that thick. And it's what Congress did in 
terms of passing laws, actual laws, in a given term. The eight-foot pile is what the bureaucracy generated in response to laws, regulations, rulemaking, all the rest. That graphically demonstrates the fact that we are today governed by executive agencies exercising vast discretion, granted illegitimately, in my judgment, by a Congress too busy to actually govern. Now, there's a doctrine that some people, myself included, would like to see revived by the court, which is the non-delegation doctrine, that says you simply have no right to give this kind of essentially lawmaking power to unelected, unaccountable executive branch agencies. Well, you mentioned the court, and I think one thing that uh, will surprise some of your readers is that though a conservative, you're not uh, wedded to the doctrine of judicial restraint, which conservatives are associated with. You argue that it's up to the courts, really, to rein in this administrative state. Why do you think that would be effective as opposed to just substituting another set of unaccountable officials into the situation? Because the ju judges are accountable to the laws written and the Constitution that they uh, supervise. What I call the judicial supervision of democracy is inevitable. As soon as John Marshall, the third most important American in my judgment, after Lincoln, Washington, then John Marshall, because he, with judicial review, said the judicial supervision of democracy's excesses is inescapable under a written constitution. Conservatives are allowing their intelligence to be bewitched by their language. They adopted the language of judicial restraint in reaction against some of the more freewheeling rights-inventing judgments of the Warren Court. But what they were really doing was embracing a classic progressive aspiration, which was to use the courts, actually but to not use the courts, to have the courts back off and let legislative and executive power run free to have a more energetic, interventionist, comprehensive, regulating government. Often in America these days, the most interesting arguments aren't between left and right, they're within the right. And the most interesting argument of all is between those like myself who argue for judicial engagement and those who still continue to argue for judicial restraint. The city government of New London, Connecticut says, ha, we're gonna use eminent domain to condemn an entire neighborhood so that we can give the property to another private interest that will pay more taxes to, guess what, us, the government of New London, Connecticut. Well, the court deferred, was deferential to the democratically elected government, and conservatives were horrified. Well, as well they should be. But they had provided the rhetoric, the language, the moral justification for judicial deference to democracy, properly understood. Conservatives want judges to enforce the Constitution and that there comes a point where deference is dereliction of judicial duty. And that's what we're arguing about. So as you look at the political landscape today um, and the um, movement of many people in the Democratic Party to the left and toward an, uh, a progressive uh, vision of society, who do you... Uh, think is sort of most in the Wilsonian tradition, who do you think most completely embodies that mindset? Probably Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren has a very firm grip on half of a point. <laughs> Her half a point is the government we have today is a plaything of rent seekers. Rent seeking is an economist term for people who bend public power to private advantage, either to confer an advantage on themselves or a disadvantage on competitors. Of course they do. And again, she is firmly in the grip of the sentimental view of government, that if only we could just enlarge the government enough, it would stop this. But look what she's saying. She's saying the government is a plaything of rent seekers and we need more government. Maybe just consider the possibility that we need less government. Progressives are always saying there's too much money in politics. You want to get money out of politics? Get politics out of the allocation of money. If government weren't so very deeply involved, waist deep in the allocation of wealth and opportunity, less money would flow into politics to influence the government. 
If you think about all the characters who, for whom you express admiration in this book, who, uh, if you could name one, who would be most helpful to us in our present predicament? Oh, Lincoln. Lincoln had prudence, which is not indifference to principle. Prudence is how you apply lucid principles to untidy realities. Lincoln dealt with a country falling apart. He dealt with a country divided on very fundamental questions. You know, we talk about all the discord today. The differences between our parties today are trivial compared to what they were in the 1850s, when the party system fell apart. There is no place for conservatism right now. It is a, an orphan persuasion in a cold and windy world, but get over it. Uh, the party system changes over time. The Republican Party didn't always exist. The Whig Party once did. I'd be a Whig today. Uh, Lincoln was a Whig before he was the first Republican president. And when this passes, this current uh, detour in the Republican history, see if they can reinterest the Republican Party in reconnecting with its uh, relationship to the founders. Lincoln's career in one sentence was an attempt to reconnect the country to the founders.